Sorry. But welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. It's just so much fun to have you here. No, I'm happy. I, I've missed a couple of years, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And I'm so happy to be back. And I was telling David, I think the, the, the event has improved since yeah. the last time I was here. Right. And it, I think of particular importance are also, I almost call them side events, but they are not really side events. Right. I mean, these lectures, the porch sessions, you know, and, and so on, by, by being conducted by others, other than the prosecutors right. themselves, bringing in academia, practitioners, the diplomats, and so on. I think it's very important. You and know. students. And students as well, yeah. Students we saw yesterday. Mm. And uh, it's good that this has, from the from Davis' report, this has really fair, fired up their enthusiasm for, for law and justice and the rule of law. And, so on. and I think it's, it's good. Yeah, and we're thrilled that it's evolved this way and the fact that uh, it's a very comfortable crowd. It's a very big crowd. It's the largest crowd we've ever had, mm -hmm. but it's a mix of prosecutors, a lot more students, That's right. academics, academics, lawyers, and so on. And, but they all they mix. They mix very well. Yeah, they mix very well. Exactly. Yeah. So we're we're yeah. thrilled. And some of the lectures have been great. I mean, lectures by academics. They've been extremely good. You know. And we. Uh, of course, transcribe those and put it in a book, which you've got, and mm -hmm. as well as uh, some of it gets out on the internet. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so there's an educational component right. to That's this right. as well. Well, what I want to talk to you about mm -hmm. is something which I knew nothing about. Okay. Uh, I interviewed Sir Desmond okay. on Saturday, and he was talking about what he believed was probably one of the first, if not the first, mm -hmm. sort of international tribunal since Nuremberg dealing with the dispute in Gambia. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's your native country. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about the dispute and maybe your involvement with Sir Desmond. Yes. Well, my relationship with Sir Desmond goes back to 1981. Mm -hmm. Uh, in that year, there was an attempt by some armed civilians to overthrow the constitutional government, which was headed by the then president, Sadao de Jara. The Gambia was, at that time, one of the few multi-party democracies in Africa. Uh, we, we had elections every five years freely and fairly conducted and acknowledged, you know, even by the opposition and the outside world, to be free and fair. You had an independent judiciary. We had a constitution which guaranteed uh, human rights, fundamental freedoms, and provided for access to the high court uh, to challenge governmental actions and so on. But in 1981, we had uh, this revolt by a kind of Marxist-Leninist group, you know, we, which we took up arms and, and tried to overthrow the government. It was unsuccessful. It was put down by loyalist forces, supported by Senegalese soldiers. Many. Many people were, of course, arrested for their involvement in, in this uh, bloody event. And then the question was, how would they be tried? The Gambia was is a small country. It was even much smaller then, some 30 years ago. Uh, I don't think we were up to a million people or just about a million people. And uh, the government headed by Sadaw Rajara had concerns about uh, the, the ability and the, the, the impartiality or the challenges that a judiciary of locals would face in trying to, to, to prosecute and adjudicate on these cases mm -hmm. of treason. These were serious charges of treason against uh, some of the senior rebels. So it was decided uh, that in order to ensure that there were free and fair trials, uh, that Gambians should not be involved, Gambian judges should not be involved in these cases nor should Gambian prosecutors be involved in the cases, but that uh, foreign judges and foreign prosecutors would be hired to come in and do the job. So as a result, a special division of the then Supreme Court was, was established, providing for the appointment of foreign judges. And the judges were appointed by the president, largely from Sierra Leone, Ghana, and Nigeria. Uh, there was a special... Uh, office in the Attorney General's chambers, special office of prosecutors, uh, which was created again with foreign prosecutors. Desmond de Silva then, uh, Sir Desmond now, was appointed as the chief prosecutor in 1981. 
to supervise the prosecution of these cases. Mm -hmm. And I had the privilege of working with him then. I was then the, the principal state attorney in the, in the Ministry of Justice in the Attorney General's office. And it was my duty then to prepare the files, especially of the top 20 or so, and forward them, forward them to him for him to, to, to prosecute. He, he, was, he was a great, he still is a great prosecutor, uh, extremely competent, of course, with a great knowledge of the law and also of practice. Uh, very articulate, very humorous too, <laughs> but very dedicated. Yes. To pursuing, you know, uh, pursuing, pursuing justice, and and it was it was a pleasure working with him uh, over those years, and I, I saw him take decisions at that time, which were not uh, palatable to some, but which were professionally correct. Mm -hmm. There was one particular case, for instance, the leader of the, of the then opposition party was suspected of having been involved in the attempted coup, in the rebellion. And uh, he was arrested and charged with, with, with treason. But before he was charged, he was arrested and put in detention like, like the others. And so a file was comprised, was put together, which went through me, and I sent it to, to, to Sir Desmond to, to review and advise and take addition. Because it was for the foreign prosecutors to decide who to prosecute and not to prosecute. Mm -hmm. Sir Desmond looked at the file and felt the evidence wasn't good. It wasn't sufficient. And that there was a risk if, for instance, if he was prosecuted, the, there was a risk that the government would be accused of having gone out in a vendetta to try to get rid of the leader of the opposition. Mm -hmm. he, he advised the Attorney General accordingly against the prosecution. Unfortunately, there were others, also foreign lawyers, in the same office who felt otherwise, who thought a case could be made out. And they advised you know, the Attorney General to go for a prosecution, which unfortunately he did. Mm -hmm. And the case collapsed on trial because the witnesses were found to, to be, you know, not credible at all. And, and it, it vindicated uh, Sir Dennis's uh, uh, own legal opinion and his professionalism yeah. uh, in dealing with those cases. I remember distinctly that case file which, which he had to deal with. Subsequently, I was asked then, when the when when the when the leader of the mission was acquitted, there was a new attorney general who then passed the file to me and asked me, should we appeal or not appeal? And I, I felt just like Sir Dennis and I wrote accordingly also mm -hmm. an opinion to the effect that we should not proceed on appeal. Uh, and in any case we could not. The chances were very nil. The judge had acquitted the chances were negligible because the judge had acquitted the accused Lightly on the issue of credibility of the witnesses, and uh, to have proceeded on appeal would have been quite an uphill task. So we closed that file, and uh, eventually the leader of the opposition was released from detention. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. What was Fatu's role in all of this? Fatu was then, I think, a, a clerk in the court, N not in the ministry, I think, not in the attorney general. I think he, she was in, on the other side, in the judiciary, uh, in the high court. Mm -hmm. And because my relationship with her also goes back to those, to those days uh, from before she went to read law and throughout her legal career as well. So she was providing support to the judges mm -hmm. at that particular time as well. And so, of course, interacted with Sir Dennis as well and uh, the prosecutors. What was the result of the trial? Do you mm -hmm. remember what the, were the convictions? There were convictions. Uh, quite a number were convicted of treason and sent to. to, to sentenced to terms of imprisonment, some for life, some for shorter terms. Um, quite a few were acquitted. Can't give the precise sure. numbers now. But, but uh, he did a good job in presenting the evidence objectively, dispassionately and, and correctly. And some were acquitted, some were convicted. And, and um, to the credit of the team and to the credit of the government and the, and the judicial system, even Amnesty International, um, which had been observing these proceedings, these trials, mm -hmm. all along, um, kind of certified that the trials had been free and f had been conducted properly with all due respect for the rights of the accused persons. Mm -hmm. How come we haven't heard more, more about this? It's, it's a bit... I, I, I have written about it oh, a I bit, 
but I haven't published it yet. Ah, okay. And I'm hoping by the end of the year to publish it. But what's important is that uh, this was actually and probably the, probably the first experiment in modern times to set up an, a hybrid court. Because this was truly a hybrid court. It was, it was hybrid. It was a, a court which was grafted into our own national court structure. But it comprised non-Gambians. The judges and the prosecutors were all Gambians, supported, of course, by other officials, in terms mm -hmm. of police investigators, investigators, etc. And the concern was the same, to ensure that uh, the local population was insulated uh, from charges of partiality and, and so on. It was best that the cases would be, there, would be managed by, by foreigners in our own country. Years later, many, many years later, decades later, of course, the same thing was tried in Sierra Leone. Yeah. Yeah. So it is, I, I think it is probably the first precedent for international hybrid courts. Can you see a relationship from that particular case, that particular experience, and here we are today in 2012 and uh, your colleague Fatou Bensouda is mm. the chief prosecutor of the ICC mm. and you're the chief prosecutor mm. Mm. of the Rwandan court with a long resume, both of your long resumes, and yet from a very small country in yes. Africa. Yes. Well, we, we, I think there is a connection in that we had this experience back home uh, in, the, in, the, in a country we cherished democratic principles and, and practiced them. We are in a country which had a, an, a, an impartial and an independent and an effective judiciary, mm -hmm. and which also was um, uh, did not hesitate to try new, 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 new initiatives uh, to deal with new situations like the hybrid court we had uh, in in in, uh, in in the Gambia at the time. It helped me also even in respect of Rwanda, because then as as the prosecutor in Rwanda, I've had to deal with the issue of. Uh, transferring cases from the ICTR to the Rwandan legal system. Mm -hmm. And so I, a, a lot of my time has been spent in, in working with my Rwandan counterparts to make sure that the Rwandan legal system, both legally and in terms of uh, practical support, can operate effectively and independently and fairly. You know? So the, the, the government experience has helped me also in, in that respect. You're working on a, a book of best practices. Yeah. Uh, is that been difficult to just get input from the other tribunals as you've been gathering mm -hmm. for ultimately the legacy of ICTY, ICTR, all those at some point are coming to an end very quickly. Mm -hmm. And you'd love to have a book of best practices. Is, what's been your experience so far in, in putting together the book? It's, it's, a, it's a project we agreed upon in 2006 that we need to put together this book which captures the best practices of, of the important aspects of our work as prosecutors from investigations to, to trials and even to post trial. It's not an easy task. Right. Um, there are many, many, many things to, things to talk about in terms of best practices, but there's just so much, that much space for a book. Mm -hmm. And so uh, identifying the areas has been a challenge, and that's why likely it's taken us such, such, such a long time. We've had to, to give considerable attention to, this, to, to, to identifying the, the, the particular parts of our process that we want to focus on, and also the, the different experiences of the tribunals, because there is not a single solution to a particular problem that we face. For instance, if you take the issue of um, whether to to join accused or to go for single accused trials, mm -hmm. you have you have uh, different approaches amongst the tribunals. In the ICTR, our preference has been to go for single accused cases. In the ICTY, they have likely gone, well, they've, they've focused a lot on multiple accused trials. But it, it, you can't say absolutely any of them is the right one. It depends on the circumstances. So you you have to in assembling the best practices, recognize that there are many options to dealing with a particular issue as a best practice. Each of them may have its advantages and disadvantages, but you need to capture all these different options in the book, in the manual. 
so that the reader is not left with the impression that there is only one single solution to a particular problem. Right, right. You know, those, those are some of the challenges we've, we've had to deal with. What's next? This this ICTR is going to wind down, and for Hassan Jallo, superstar that you are, what's next? Well, this year in March, um, the Security Council appointed me as the Chief Prosecutor also of the International Residual Mechanism for the Criminal Tribunals. That is the mechanism which takes over from the ICTR okay. and the Yugoslav Tribunal. It's already started taking over from ICTR the July this year and then from Yugoslav Tribunal next year. It's a four-year mandate I have for that, but of course, as you rightly say, the ICTR will finish its work, I think, before end of 2014. I'd like to finish the work of the ICTR and get the residual mechanism well established and then uh, see where I go on from there then. Well, you've, done, you've, you've, you've left such a wonderful legacy mm -hmm. in this international criminal law world. You must, be, you must have a sense of pride. Well, it's, it's not working alone. I mean, you, you know, you, you depend on colleagues, sure. you depend your, on your support staff. Uh, there are so many, many people who have done a lot, contributed a lot to ensuring that the work of the ICTR is a success. The, this event that, we, that you host here, for instance, is an important part of that process. Our interaction here as prosecutors and interaction with academia and others also helps us in finding solutions to some of the challenges that we face. Mm -hmm. So you, you've, got, uh, you've got assistance from a very broad spectrum, uh, with the governments, the diplomatic community, the staff, and uh, your colleague prosecutors, etc. Uh, so it's, it's a tribute to all of us. Plus you brought George back and yes. <laughs> you, you heard the story about the, the luggage. That yes, <laughs> yes. I, George, of, of course, I hear sent uh, Luis Moreno Campos luggage in the wrong direction and you had to be shot. <laughs> I'll never forget that. <laughs> George is a good guy. He's, my, he's one of my senior appeals counsel. Yeah. And uh, he's, he's, a, he's a good fellow. He really, and he was so well intentioned. And I never told the story to him because I, I didn't dare, you know. You didn't want to. No, no. But now, five years later, who cares? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> He's very well intentioned. Oh yeah, it was that, it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was great. Well, thank you thank for for coming. And I know they probably are looking for you on the porch. So. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure being here, and I look forward to next year. Again. Ah, terrific! Yes, thank I look you. Look forward to next year.